All right. Um, so today we have Sarah. I'm just going to give it to her so she can go tell us a little bit about herself. Hello. So my name is Sarah Nokoy. Um, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm based in the UK. Um, I live uh, on an island at the top of Scotland and I'm a caregiver for my mother who has dementia. Nice. Well, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Wondering if you can tell us how long you've been a caregiver for. Um, well, my mum was diagnosed in January of last year, um, but we began to see changes before that in the previous year. So um, we've, been, we've been kind of living with this now for maybe two and a half years. Yeah. And so what made you actually go and um, go through the process of the diagnoses? Like, did you, what kind of changes did you see? What did you experience as a caregiver? Um, I began to notice that she was becoming more anxious. Um, she was struggling with everyday, day-to-day -day tasks um, and forgetting more, asking the same questions, things like that, but just not managing her life the way she used to be. Um, so I, I, in the end, I made my own doctor's appointment for her to take her. Um, and we started the, the process then of, of looking at um, a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So even before and after, uh, where did your loved one live? Did she live with you? Did she live elsewhere? Uh, she lives about five miles away. Um, so she's not too far away from me. Um, my dad, she lives with my dad. Um, he is in his 80s now. So um, I'm kind of looking after the two of them. She is the one that has the di diagnosis. He's doing very well um, living with her. But of course, he's getting older. And, and so it needs more help and support from me. Um, I also have a sister who lives in Colorado, but she's obviously, she's not able to travel right now, um, which adds another dimension to everything. Difficult, you know, when your families are separated. That's really rough. Um, how does task management work between you and your father um, in terms of just taking care of your mom? Well, we have a, a memory board. We wrote a memory board. We kind of joke that it's um, usually more for me and dad than it is for mom. <laughs> she, the idea was that, you know, we'd write down what day it was, what she was having for her meals, things like that. But uh, she doesn't always look at it, but we have it. So um, we speak every day. I visit. Um, dad calls me if he has any problems. I write things on their calendar. So lots of writing things down um i i do their shopping i collect their medication things like that so yeah um we just liaise on the phone and, and just me visiting you know pretty much every day has covid um put a pin on that uh during the past few months or were you still able to visit your mom um covid was terrible because initially um i really didn't want to risk the possibility of bringing infection um under uk um advice and law i could actually go in and be her carer um but of course i you know i have family as well and i was having to go to shops and things so i was trying to minimize so at, at the very beginning i was leaving uh the shopping on the doorstep and we would stand at the end of the drive but um mum found that too painful an experience and so we decided that we would actually connect and, and I would kind of count her as my household. Mm -hmm. um, she was, it was too distressing for her to see me, but not be able to hug me or anything. And she didn't really understand, you know, it was, it was too, too complicated to try mm -hmm. and explain. Yeah. So we changed it. We mixed it up, but <laughs> eventually because it was just too hard to manage. Yeah. Yeah. COVID has definitely made things so much harder for caregivers, especially if the uh, loved ones live in assisted care homes. They're mm. just so blocked from the world. Um, what would you say was the most, or is the most rewarding experience um, about being a caregiver? I think um, for myself, it, it's, it's been a privilege to look after my mom. She has always done it for me. She's cared for me my whole, childhood and half my adulthood life as well um and so i think the privilege of knowing that i'm doing it um and knowing that you know the end of her life however that long that is months or weeks or years we don't know 
but I, I like to know that I have given her the best possible support that I could um, with my circumstances um, to make that as, le as least distressing as possible for her. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. And what about the most challenging experience? What would you say, at least so far? Um, the most challenging thing I would say is, is the living grief that that i feel um it's a it's a grief seeing your mom who was so capable and so able now um is so unable uh i cry nearly every day <laughs> it's very emotional um and it's it's a grieving process that i'm going through well thank you for sharing that is that on its own must be so hard um, have you used any tools that have made your experience a little bit easier? I know you have a memory board, but is there anything else that you've been using to kind of track or maybe even help yourself as a caregiver in terms of self-care? Um, I've been using a, there was an app that had like games on it for mom. Mm -hmm. Um, so she, you know, could play little games and do kind of logic things and memory games and things like that um I haven't really been using anything for myself no I wrote a book <laughs> which helped me which was therapy for me um but I haven't used any any other product or app no yeah so the next question was about your book I was wondering if you can just give us a little debrief as to one, how that process went, especially um, assuming that you wrote it while, while you were being a caregiver for your mom, as mm -hmm. well as mm -hmm. what the book is about um, and how it's helped you as a, a relief, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, my, um, so my mom was diagnosed in January, as I said, um, and also I began sea swimming. Now I live in a very cold area, so the, the water is like you know, sometimes it's frozen and sometimes it's, you know, like five or six degrees. Like at the minute it's 12 degrees. It's, it's pretty cold. And I found that experience really helped me cope with my mom. Um, and so I just, and I, I talked about my mom's dementia a lot on Instagram and things and people found that really helpful. So I decided to write a book about the, the kind of shared experience of coping through sea swimming um and, and just talking really openly about my mom and how how the dementia was affecting all of us as a family and um and me as her daughter and and providing the care and the support um so i published it a month ago and uh it's done really well so i'm really pleased thank you thank you so it's called salt on my skin which is the the salt from the seawater but also the tears so you know i kind of felt it was important to recognize that emotion and, and crying is very much a part of uh, dealing with somebody who has dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very open about that. It's like I press print on my diary. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have that forever. And it's such a big yeah, accomplishment absolutely. too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so do you know of any, or what would you say is a big misconception that people have about caregiving or dementia? Um, I suppose people assume that um, dementia is the same for everybody. Um, and I think I, I would say it's different. Uh, there's, there's so many different kind of variants and it can affect people in so many ways. Um, I'm still learning myself, <laughs> you know, all the time. Um, and I suppose people, myself included, Perhaps we just, we, I mean, I kind of just think that there's no hope really that, you know, the hope for the person has gone um, and, and helping certainly my dad to understand that she can be content in a day, even though she's lost what she had, she can still have some contentment around her. Mm -hmm. Are you able to speak upon your dad, uh, your dad's experience with just living with somebody with dementia and how, I can't even imagine how that feels, but are you able to describe it in a few words? Um, I think he finds it very difficult because there's a shift in their marriage. She can no longer cook. Um, you know, all the things that she used to do that she took care of within the family, she can't do anymore. Um, and I think he feels anxious and very sad 
when um, he, he wants to do it all for himself. He doesn't want to receive support and, and, um, and help. So it's trying to encourage him to accept that it's not a weakness or a failing if you need some extra help. You know, you're an 81 year old man and it's perfectly fine to need a little bit of extra help. Um, he finds that difficult. Um, well, I'm glad that you're there. At least you're only five miles away and That's not right. 5,000 yeah. miles away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, for my sister, it's a different story. She has to manage the relationship via um, uh, FaceTime or something like that. So that's mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. Well, at least we have that technology now. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Different days now. Yeah. <laughs> different days. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say were some of the biggest lessons that you've learned that you would want to share for future caregivers or maybe early stage caregivers? Mm -hmm. um, I think I would say it's, it's okay to accept, to, to kind of write, some days you're just going to get bad days or even bad minutes and those times will pass and um, you will get good times as well. So to kind of write off the bad um, and enjoy the good as best you can um, and make memories for yourself. Um, and and just make the quality of their life as as best as it can possibly be mm -hmm. um, you know and, and 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 look after yourself uh, and accept that it's hard and accept that you need to sometimes just have a good cry into your pillow yeah you just gotta let it out <laughs> yeah all so the best people do, do it self-care um, I've always been good at self-care, so, so, uh, nice. Not a lot know, of people can me, do that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, for me, for example, the swimming became a thing that I prioritized. So it was accepting that I prioritized the swimming because that really helped me. I, I even prioritized that sometimes over housework or ironing or whatever. Um, it was important that I did something that made me feel good and helped me cope yeah that's actually really good a lot of people are so lost um mm -hmm. the previous interviews that we've done they've just said that they're just unable to find the resources and so even having you as an influencer i guess on instagram sharing your stories writing this book is definitely helping a huge gap or uh, mm -hmm. definitely filling this huge gap that we're missing well, that's great to know. And, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I wear my heart on my sleeve and I'm happy to talk about it. And so, um, and I also draw strength from other people on Instagram mm -hmm. um, and following their stories. And then you realize that you're not alone. So I do think if you're able to talk about it, that's really helpful because we're all feeling pretty much the same. We're all grief stricken for our loved one. Um, and we're all tired, you know. <laughs> we're all kind of trying to get it right yeah i guess you just have to learn to balance this new challenge this other part-time full-time job um, right yeah yeah so kind of going off that would mm -hmm. you what is your what are your thoughts at least in this moment about um assisted care living in the future or would you prefer that your mom and your dad come live with you have you thought about that yeah, I have thought about that. And I mean, for as long as I possibly can, um, I think if something, if there was a, a crisis or if, the, if it got to the point where dad was unable to cope um, on his own with mum, then I would move in with them because I would want to keep mum's house that's familiar to her and I would move in with them. And I've discussed that with my husband and... Um, you know, as best, as best as we can achieve that, that's what I would aim to do. Um, if she needed to move into a residential home, if, if things became so awful, and, and, you know, I've been advised about this as well, then um, there's no shame in that. You have to find out what works for you and your family. And that could be different for everybody that you speak to. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but my initial... Um, thoughts about it are that I would want to move in and care for my mom um you know and and 
I've made that promise to myself that I would do that um, if I was absolutely if I was able to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah, I know it's such a triggering topic because you hear so many mm -hmm. stories about just neglect. Um, mm -hmm. That's just kind of comes with the fact that not much not much resources are put into assisted living as well as senior homes mm -hmm. or retirement homes. Um, but that's great that you've kind of given it some thought. Um, yeah. How do you think that your loved one is feeling on most days? Um, I know for a fact that she, she describes herself as feeling bewildered. Um, she, yeah, she says, I just feel bewildered all the time. She often says that she feels useless. Um, but actually, the, the, the greatest or the hardest thing about dementia is also the greatest strength. So she gets up distressed and upset and cries, but then she forgets that she's been like that. So she is actually quite content. She's quite placid um, in the moment. Mm -hmm. In the moment, she's quite con content and placid. And when I'm around there, you know, she's happy to see me. She loves my dog, absolutely loves my dog. Um, so the dog is a huge help. Um, she keeps asking for the dog to come on holiday and stay with her. <laughs> <laughs> we have to tell her no because she would just feed it and feed it and feed it. She would forget that she's fed it, you know, so the dog would be a barrel by the end of the week. <laughs> so... Uh, but uh, she, yeah, she's, you know, generally she says that she's bewildered and she doesn't want to be like this. Um, but at the same time, she just is now knitting funny shaped things or doing a jigsaw puzzle. And we just, we just keep her content in the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great thing, a great way to think about it too, that she's content in the moment. Right, exactly, yeah. It's, it's the best that we can do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what about um, concerns? What would you say are your biggest caregiving concerns now as well as um, down the road? Um, the biggest concern I have is the what if. What if something happens to dad? Um, what if he, you know, he becomes very sick and mom tries to get help and you know, all of those terrible things. What if she wanders off? What if she um, tries to drive to get help for dad? Things like that. So I think my biggest concern is um, a crisis, were a crisis to happen and, and she wouldn't know what to do or how to manage. Or I guess, were she to try and boil the kettle when it's empty? Things like that. Or leave the iron switched on or things, you know, that kind of thing. They're the things that worry me. Yeah. Well, thankfully, that, thankfully your dad lives there with your mom. She's not alone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least that's something that kind of can give you a peace of mind, which is so important during these times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of what Memories is doing is we're trying to kind of get information on um, early stage um caregivers which i think you fall at, fall under a lot of the people that we found on social media including instagram as well as the facebook support groups they're very late in the stage and um, i think we just kind of want to get a broader uh depth of information for all stages just because you just like you said every single type of dementia is different there's so many different stages yeah. on top of that mm -hmm. so in the i guess in the first year maybe when you didn't necessarily um she wasn't diagnosed yet um mm -hmm. what did you i don't know did you kind of justify her behavior did you realize that something was wrong how did you kind of what was your mindset how did you go about it um i knew that something was very wrong um and i was trying to balance that with dad who was scared um I was the first person to drip feed the word dementia in um, and dad said she doesn't have dementia. So um, that was fear talking. I totally get it. I completely understand. Um, I rang a, a helpline actually in the UK. We have a dementia helpline, a 24 hour line. 
Um, and I rang them because I was so grief stricken. To th- I was so scared. I was scared myself um, of hearing the diagnosis. Um, so uh, really and truly, I, you know, I just worked hard to, to get her to see the doctors. She had a brain scan and she had, you know, various physical tests and clinical tests before she could have the diagnosis. Um, and so it was a case of working hard to introduce those things and, and make sure that we got the best support that we could. Um, and it was a process of elimination looking at the medication she was taking and was that affecting her but um really and truly i i i pretty much knew what was going to happen um and so i had to come to terms with that myself before i could begin to accept that we were going to hear that diagnosis in the end mm-hmm. yeah because it's like i guess when you hear it it's like you can see the next few years of your life right that's exactly it yeah Yeah. and even when yeah that's right and even when the doctor um you know he diagnosed her and he he basically said your life expectancy is between four and eight years and 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 i'm thinking and what's that going to look like that's exactly what i thought you know what is that going to look like Mm -hmm. um because you immediately cut to the end stages she's not going to recognize me she won't know who i am she won't know who the kids are, all of that kind of thing. Um, But there's a whole bunch of other stuff in between. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I was also kind of anxious about her starting to behave inappropriately in public and things like that. That was a worry that she might start to do some very strange things Um, because it happens. But, you know, everybody's different. You know, like a friend of mine, you know, his dad just like, pretended to use the bathroom even though he was just out in public and you know that was just a huge fear of mine that she might just do something really um situationally inappropriate Mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely I guess like the beginning symptoms when you start to recognize something is off yeah yeah absolutely and and she she was I'm sorry she I was just going to say she herself was like there's nothing wrong with me I mean that was the hard thing Mm. um and she was she was afraid but she was also like there's nothing wrong with me stop you know and she went to the doctors and she would say can you reassure my daughter that I'm not going mad you know or I'm here to I'm here to reassure my daughter once again (laughs) my daughter's telling me and I was saying there is something and she was saying there's nothing wrong with me but she accepts her diagnosis now and will say I have dementia, will tell people that she has it. But initially she was very, um, she, she didn't believe that she had it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one thing as a caregiver to be worried about the diagnosis. It's another thing as the actual person. Right, yeah. They also know kind of what's coming. Yeah. Which is really scary. And she, she told me too that she thought, um she thought you know like when when she was diagnosed and then we walked out of the hospital she was like why didn't they lock me up you know so she had made she had mentally thought well they're just going to cart me off put me in a room and lock it um which is misguided completely misguided but you know that was a fear of hers was that um she would be and so in a way once she was diagnosed it was a bit of a relief because we weren't trying to grapple with what's going wrong with mom mm-hmm. and yeah, some, we, some answers have been given yeah so right, yeah. now you can use the resources that are provided to you right yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah okay so i think i will pass it along to rashan who will kind of go in depth of what memories is doing and mm-hmm. um just some maybe questions about some tools as well as social media okay yeah, for sure. I mean, usually um, there's some questions that I'd like to tackle, but I think you're an extraordinary caregiver with a, a really cool story. So I think I would love to dive deeper into um, the book writing process for you, um, the cathartic nature of that, perhaps what you see next in terms of um, having a channel to cope through what you're dealing with and how that process has been for you. Okay. So um the book i i've always been a communicator i've always you know i've written a blog and things like that um and i funnily enough i was 
on the mind of writing a fictional book about a woman with dementia um, and writing to her kids. Um, and then, you know, truth or fiction becomes truth because uh, it, my, I found myself with my mom. Um, so I just found talking about it, first of all on Instagram, talking about it so helpful um, and being honest. I just found that so helpful. Um, but I also found just writing about it a way of processing um, how I felt. Um, and I, I mean, I was saying earlier that I, you know, I've sold like in the first month, it's a self-published book. In the first mm -hmm. month, I've sold nearly 600 copies. Amazing. Um, so, and people always come back to the same thing. They like the honesty, but they also, just about nearly everybody says, I've got an aunt, I've got a cousin, you know, I've got a sister, I've got a mom. Everybody can connect in some way to dementia. And it's just such a huge, vastly growing um, condition. Um, and I, you know, we've, even my mom and I have talked about this in her more lucid times that we're, we're curing the cancers and the heart disease and we're keeping people living for longer. And mm -hmm. so it's probably pretty natural that something's going to get them in the end. And, and, you know, that's kind of how she feels that, she she uh, had two different cancers in her younger life, so you know she's kind of like, well, something's gonna something's gotta give in the end. So, um, but yeah, the book writing has really helped, really, really helped me. Okay, well, no, thank you for sharing, and I think that really brings up the point of community, which is something that I wanted to get to with social media. I think that's what we're trying to do with Instagram. One is to highlight different caregivers and their experiences so that others who are on the platform can see that there's people similar, that they're going through something like that, and I think you're able to achieve that through the community from your book writing, the people who are engaging with you. Um, I would say in the earlier days, perhaps before you started Instagram and when you were first grappling with um, the diagnosis what was your um sort of method of i would say um understanding what your next steps are whether that was communicating with folks whether there were support groups whether that was personally searching for information how did you go about that um i pretty much did my own research so okay. um i you know because i live in a really small place i live on an island with mm -hmm. like twenty two thousand people so there's not a lot you know it's it's small mm -hmm. um and so there's not a huge amount of resources, physical resources to tap into here, although there is um, a dementia hub that we have. But I just found, for me personally, I found the, the best thing to do was to educate myself as much as I could um, and try to understand what was happening, what could happen, um, and what, you know, what we could do. So kind of played out in my head the potentials um, and, and how I would respond if that happened so that I could make the decisions when I'm capable rather than when I'm too emotional or stressed or do you know what I mean? I needed to. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you have clear, at least the, the little bit of clarity in the beginning to be able to, to work through, um, while exactly. the stress is beginning to rise for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, um, I would say, so you did say that you manage self-care very well um, and that you have a, a good support network. I'm wondering um, how your relationship with your family has evolved and having that dual role of being a caregiver um, and a loved one, it does take a different toll on different individuals. Um, I'm wondering how you've seen that mature um, for yourself, that relationship and how you feel. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. People respond in different ways mm -hmm. um, to things. Um, and I think, you know, I think my dad kind of responded through fear in a little bit mm -hmm. um, initially and, and still now he's frightened mm -hmm. because he, his wife has disappeared and sure. somebody else is in her place with mm -hmm. the same face and body, um, but a very different mind and sometimes a different behavior. So, um, and my sister lives in America, mm -hmm. you know, and I totally get that she has a different she feels helpless because she's so far away. Um, so trying to manage all of those things where she feels involved and she's, she's playing to her strengths, which is, I'm, I'm the touchy-feely person that they're there, it's all gonna be okay, you know, we can mm -hmm. do this. 
and she's the organizer, the, the planner. Um, I'm not. <laughs> so um, so it, it was kind of looking at playing to our different strengths and, and, okay. and, and processing. Also, I have children and um, talking to them and explaining to them that they're, I mean, they're older children. They're 20 and 26, so they're okay. older. But, but even so, their relationship with their grandparent is, is going to change dramatically. Um, and, and it was just to, to kind of prepare them a little bit to say, you know, one day she might not know who you are or she might not. And that, and then that might pass and she might know you the next time and, and things like that. And, um, she, she used to kind of send shopping deliveries to my son who's at college and, and then she started forgetting. So I found myself filling in the gaps a little bit and just kind of saying, you know, you need to tell me if she's done something or is forgetting to do something and in the very early stages I could say you know you didn't do the groceries this week and, and she would go ahead and do it but now that's completely gone we don't even you know I didn't bother to, to, to do anything like that anymore so just okay. kind of preparing the family um, was important to me um, and preparing myself kind of uh, managing my emotion because you lose them twice I think um you grieve for somebody that's alive and then of mm -hmm. course when she goes i'll be grieving all over again mm -hmm. for a different mm -hmm. reason absolutely that's a really profound um way to put it i think as well um especially because this is um something that individuals live with and um uh, it's progressive and uh there's yeah. a different experience each time I, we've spoken to some individuals where it's been a steady decline in sort of cognitive uh function and others it's a plateau then a complete dip and mm -hmm. it's almost relearning who that new individual is and providing care on whatever that relationship yeah. is. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know you mentioned that um, there were some brain games and things that were used in the past. Um, I'm wondering um, if there's any technology used in the home right now currently, um, whether that's either monitoring services or, or even anything computer or app based that's been able to help with care um, currently for your parents and then for yourself. Mm -hmm. at the moment we're not at the stage where technology is okay. needed so here's the other challenge mm -hmm. my dad you know like if it's he can watch tv and he can change channel but <laughs> you know he's 81 he's not used to yeah. technology he has no yeah. idea um my mom could use an ipad mm -hmm. and could use a laptop and could do everything but now she can't mm -hmm. so we literally have an ipad with press this press that, do this. Um, so technology for dad is, um, worries him because mm. he, does, you know, he doesn't really know how to use it because of his age. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we have the, the app with the games on and we have a whiteboard that we use as a, as a memory board. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we don't have anything else. And mum was pretty resistant to it initially. I don't need anything. There's nothing mm. wrong with me. Um, we have joked that, you know, I said, I'm going to get a tracking device in your shoe if you misbehave, you know, just kind of like yeah. trying, but I have drip fed a few things, um, okay. so that dad knows, okay. um, that were she to start wandering off, for example, and again, this is part of the educating myself. Um, I made myself aware. I didn't even know you could get a tracking device for your shoe, mm -hmm. but it turns mm -hmm. out you can. <laughs> <laughs> and so then she said well I'm going to hide my shoes and you know so <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah she's not daft um, so yeah I, we're not using anything at the moment but it is something that I'm always thinking should the axe fall again mm -hmm. For sure. and we have to recalibrate again then mm -hmm. you know there, there's, there's things around that we can use okay and it seems like humor plays a big part in your relationship, which I think is amazing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We've always had, our family has always had a good sense of humor and we can have a joke and a laugh. And okay. um, I think that, you know, that helps every day. Like every day we'll have a bit of a joke about it. And, you know, um, so with, in the UK, the hairdressers weren't open for ages, mm. like for months. Um, they should be key workers in my view. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my mom like had, you know, like really, her hair was getting really long. And then I yeah. went to the house and she was like, had a bulldog clip in her hair. We would call it a bulldog clip, right? Mm -hmm. And 
guessing you know what it mm -hmm. and she he was like clipped her hair back in that and so i just said right they really will cut you off mom if you go around with a stationary <laughs> covered in your hair that's it <laughs> so um you know we could have a bit of a joke about that so then i got some hair slides and we said let's manage your hair differently until the hairdressers is open but yeah we can you know we can have a bit of a joke and even if mum doesn't always remember the important this is what I think the important thing is is that the happy feelings are there right there and then I remember and dad remembers but for mum she forgets but she just knows that right there in the moment she's happy mm. and then you know when it goes it goes but at least for the moment I, I've we've been able to keep her happy okay um and then I think one final question for me here is, so in terms of uh, potentially the way memories could help you, um, so one of the options of the application that we're working through is specifically for caregivers, where um, someone like yourself would be able to interact with the application to set reminders and schedules for your mom, um, and also for any caregiving tasks that are needed, perhaps even to remind your dad uh, on ways to support, and um, you would get those notifications on your phone. It would let you you know, when you need to reach out to your loved ones, um, as well as check in for mood support to see either how you're doing or if you would want, prompt those questions to your mother to be able to check in and then assess that information. And then the two functions there would be to ensure that tasks are completed and for you to have some visibility of trends on how care is being managed. Is that something that you think would provide some value? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, my life is ruled by post-it notes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just have them everywhere and, and <laughs> I think um, they almost become irrelevant <laughs> because there's so many of them. But I think okay. something that was, you know, a, an app that went to your phone or your iPad mm -hmm. would, yeah, would be hugely beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Uh, amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you um, so You're much welcome. for taking the time to chat with us and providing this really fantastic um, interview. I think for everyone that's listening, please feel free to once again mention the name of your book. Hopefully we can get some more people to take a look. Yeah, it's called Salt on My Skin mm -hmm. and it's from, it's by Sarah Kennedy Norkoy, that's me. Um, and you can certainly get it on Amazon uh, in the States. So, or wherever okay. you are, you can get it from Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Thank well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.